Okay, we're here at the Palm Springs Air Museum. It's uh, March the 5th, the year of 2002. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, along with Ed Altshuler. Today we're going to interview Howard Marvin. Howard was a Marine Corps pilot in World War II. He was one of the first guys that went into Guadalcanal, uh, flew F-4F Wildcats. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other stuff. Nice to have you here, Howard. Thank you. Okay, now tell me, when and where were you born? I was born in Spokane, Washington, but I don't know anything about it because my family moved to Florida shortly oh, yeah. before that. Do you, do you remember why they moved to Florida? Well, I, I guess it was because of the boom in real estate down there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but also they were there for the bus, too, which is long before 29. No kidding. Uh, is that right? Florida didn't even notice 1929. They were so poor. <laughs> where did where in Florida did they move to? Clearwater. Clearwater, yeah. That's on the uh, the Gulf, Gulf Coast. Coast, right? Yeah. Right, by Tampa. I was there one time. Yeah. Uh -huh. St. Pete. Yeah. So, what did your dad do? Uh, yeah. He worked was for Purina Mills. When we went there, he was in the real estate business. Purina Cat Chow and food and uh, yeah, but stuff like that. When we went there, why well, everything was booming. And selling real estate and they were I remember one case where a man traded a fellow a pair of shoes for a lot nobody could understand why he'd give up the shoes because <laughs> he could have used a razor blade on them and there wasn't anything he could do with a lot <laughs> sharpen his razor blade at least <laughs> oh gosh um, what was your dad's name James, James. G uh -huh. and uh, do you know um, where your ancestors came from well, they, they were English and Irish, and they came from Kentucky. Oh, yeah. Walked over the Appalachians. Yeah. My and mother then, was from Canadian. Your mother was Canadian? Yeah. What was her maiden name? Or what was her Howard. Name? And her first name was? Cora. Cora. Uh -huh. uh, and so where did she and your dad meet then? They met in Washington State. And well, Spokane. How did your dad end up, or how did they end up in Spokane or in Washington? He was a traveling salesman, and she, her family lived there. I see. She worked for the Sportsman Review or whatever, the Spokane Review or whatever that paper was. Yeah. In fact, she was an old maid. I think she was 20 years old. It's <laughs> an old maid in those days. Right. <laughs> um, what did, um, okay, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have two brothers. And what are their names? Um, James and Ned and Thomas E. Uh -huh. Were they older than you? Or? They were younger. Oh. They are both deceased. Uh -huh. So you were the oldest then? Yes. Yeah. Um, did you do a lot of fishing down in Florida when you were growing up? No, a lot of sailing, but not much fishing. We caught whatever fish we needed to eat, but that's about all. Right. Yeah. Sailing, what, what did you no, say? Just for fun, just little 14 footers. The um, water gets is, gets pretty warm there, doesn't it? Much yes, warmer it does. than it is out here. I mean, yes, was, it does. <laughs> in the summertime, you think you're in a in a bath. That's almost, right. Isn't it? You have to go swimming at night. Dude, yeah. Because it's too hot in the daytime. Get in the water. Yeah. Um, what about uh, mosquitoes and things like? We that? had plenty of those. <laughs> plenty of mosquitoes. Yeah. So besides sailing, what did you guys do for fun? Uh, you know, played football, did the tennis. It's a normal thing to grow up, growing up poor. Yeah. I uh, worked for two dollars a day, and there was six guys who wanted my job. You know. What what kind of work were you doing? Oh, I unloaded carloads of feed, or worked in a grocery store for twenty hours for two dollars. What was the size of? Uh, Dr. Marvin Leaf has just joined us. Okay. This is Howard. Um, Hi, Howard. <laughs> what was the population of Clearwater in Boston? 5,000. About 5,000. Have you been back there since? Or oh, I've been back there several times. It's about 250,000 now. Is it that much? So, tourism, I suppose, the big. No, and people moved there. Uh -huh. 
all of Florida only had a million and a half people. Now Tampa's over a million, so Florida's grown quite a little. Right. Yeah. Um, so what? Let's see. What was the job that you had? Did you say that where you got your two dollars? You were uh -huh. unloading feed and stuff. Yeah, hundred pound, two hundred pound bags. <laughs> I get you. Get you in shape? Did you play sports in school? Yeah, football, tennis, yeah. basketball. I was too slow though. <laughs> what position did you play in football? Center and linebacker. Did you guys have a good team? Real good for the little town. What did you? We went up and played the coal miners in August and early September, and then we played till through Christmas, and then they came down and we played them again. We played football from August to January. Is that right? Did uh, uh, would you run single wing in those days or oh, no, Notre Dame, Dame box? Shift. Notre Dame box, yeah. And the uh, so you were as a center. It was a a, a, a um, yeah. You would, you would, it would yeah yeah. <laughs> what do you call it? A shot like a shotgun formation that they call nowadays. You didn't just hand it to the quarterback. No, right? no. Did you, when you were a center like that, and I know they, in that Notre Dame box, the guys would go in motion, so you'd have to kind of lead the, the quarterback or the guy that you were centering to sometimes, would you not? No. No? No. You, just, you had to hit him on the knee. Oh. And could you luck? <laughs> well, if you didn't, <laughs> it was bad. Uh -huh. So you would, but if you were looking back there, you'd have to be ready for, for somebody hitting you pretty quick, right? Uh, oftentimes in the head. <laughs> it was it was legal in those days to hit center in the head, but uh, if you hit me in the head, then I hit you in the head. So we kind of didn't do that. And what kind of helmets did you have? Not very good. <laughs> kind of the soft leather. Yeah. About <laughs> like about like an aviator or something. That's very good. Yeah. Well, usually the tape inside was broken or something. There was a hole. Did you ever get hurt playing? No, not much. A collarbone or something, you know, nothing. So was that like Clearwater High School? Yeah. Or did you play for? Okay. How did you like school uh, as far as classes and? Well, I, I didn't know any other way to do it. What did? What were your favorite classes in school? Oh, math and chemistry. And what year did you graduate then from high school? Thirty-five. Thirty-five. And so, what did you do after graduation? I went. I didn't quite graduate, I guess. I uh, would have graduated in 35, but uh, I went, had a scholarship to the University of Florida and they found out I was only 16, so they wouldn't, then they reneged on the scholarship and said I had to go back to high school. Oh. Was that Which, a football scholarship? Yeah, oh. and so uh, I went back to high school, took everything. The teachers lived right by my family, so they weren't going to put up with me fooling around, so I had to take six classes a day. <laughs> anyway, then they changed coaches and they reneged on my scholarship, so <laughs> oh. brought in a bunch of coal miners from West Virginia and Pennsylvania. So anyway, I went to the University of Florida and waited table and got out in 38. What were you majoring in? Oh, we didn't really do much majoring at that time. We were I had that AA thing, and I took a lot of math and chemistry and stuff. Now, Florida's in Business Gainesville. administration. Florida's in Gainesville? Yes. Because yeah, of, don't you know who the Gators are? No, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Spurrier, they just lost their coach, though. That's right. <laughs> that might <laughs> help. I went to the Redskins. Yeah. Do you still do you follow football? Well, still, yeah, sure. Still like the Gators? Sure. <laughs> I thought, did you not like him as a coach? Or? No, I don't know him at all. Long after me. I know that, but I mean, yeah. turned out some pretty good teams. Yeah. They've been down a little bit this, I know this last year they didn't play that as well. So. Yeah. Um, did your dad, uh, was he able to work all during the Depression? or did Sure. He, he was. Yeah. Let's go on. I, uh, okay. Um, so and we moved to Miami, and I was out of college, and I worked a little bit in the brokerage business. And uh, then I borrowed 
$200 from George Smathers, who was a fraternity brother of mine, a senator for years. Yeah, right. And went in the chicken business. I bought a chicken farm from my father and my uncle. They couldn't make the $50 a month payment on it. So I built it up to 3,000 chickens. And I was raising fertile eggs. They were baby chicks and baby chicks. And uh, eating eggs were eight cents a dozen, and I was getting 60 cents. So I was making more money than anybody. I was at a Model A Ford, and I was making over $200 a month, and that was about what my father made. And so Roosevelt was paying 24 cents for baby chicks down in South America. So I went out to the Pan Air Clipper ship to ship them down there. And uh, they said they had plenty of seats, but the freight was sold out for chickens for a year. So my father said, why don't you two boys learn to fly and fly your own chickens down there? So I went to the Army and they were out to lunch. So I went to the Navy and I ran into an old Marine captain and he said, What the hell do you want to get in the goddamn Navy for? Why don't you get in the Marine Corps? I said, Well, I'm just here to find out about it. He says, Take this over to the doctor. So I was pretty scared of the guy. And I, so I took it over to the doctor and he stuck his finger in my rear and then in my mouth and said, you pass. Same finger? <laughs> and then I came back and there was about four or five ensigns and this old captain sitting around in a semicircle and they started asking me a bunch of questions. But then he said, sign here and I don't want really anything to get out of there. So, so I signed. Well, about two weeks they called me up and said, you report out here. And uh, Monday, and you'll live here for Mary training. I said, you've got to lost your mind, man. I've got 3,000 chickens out of here. I, I'm not going to come over there. Somebody's got to feed them and collect the eggs. And they said, well, that's okay. You can live there. You just report here every morning at 7.30. So, so I'd get up about 5 o'clock and feed the chickens and water them. And, and I'd go over and fly a little bit take ground school and go back and collect the eggs and finally sold all the chicken. And that's how I got in the Marine Corps. <laughs> now that would have been what year then? 1940. 1940. And yeah. where were you taking your ground uh, training this year? Miami. Uh, Opalaka. I had some funny thing. I had a little experience in drafting they had me draw the airfield, the new airfield they were going to build. It was the greatest airfield. It was had three, three runways to a hangar and three runways away from the hangar. The hangar was here. And you, whatever way the wind was blowing, you landed toward the hangar. And on this side, same thing, you took off away from the hangar on the other side. So the taxiing was absolutely minimal. It was the greatest plan for an airport. I don't know why they don't use it more, but today they don't have to worry about the wind as much as we did then. And it wasn't really that reason. We didn't need to worry about it too much, but they land pretty much toward the toward the hangars now, or toward the... What were the uh, planes that you trained? Well, you just in those days, it was N3N. It was built by the Navy. And then uh, I went to. Then I was out for a couple of months and went to Pensacola. And and when I got out, I I was instructor there. Foss and I. Foss was two weeks behind me. He was a class behind me, and then we were in the same squadron. That's Joe Foss. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. fact, he's the only one that ever could do an outside loop, and he finally got it done once. But the rest of it tried a lot, but we couldn't make it. What? Okay, tell me about an outside. Describe an outside loop to me. Well, you what? know what an outside loop I is. I don't, don't know you? what. No, I don't. I want to know. Well, you 
Well, do you know what a regular loop is like this? No, nope. don't know. Don't know anything about loops. You tell me all about. It. Well, then you push it over like that and try to go up that way, and you're on the outside of the plane of the loop. Oh, okay. Instead of like that, you're oh, instead of go oh, this way, like, which is easy. You go this way, which is impossible almost. Could either break the wings off or or you can't get it pushed up on this side. So you're on your back at the bottom of that. That's right. At, I see. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Very few of them. Anyway, he, he got it around. Oh, yeah, it was a pretty boring thing. We, we had to work six hours a day and two hours at night. There was students, and I'll tell you, that gets to be a, a pain. That causes drinking and chasing girls, if there is any. Speaking of girls, did you have girlfriends by this time? Or girl well, Pensacola you? didn't have any girls. They all got <laughs> married by the time they were 17 or 18. How about a college? Or? Yeah, uh, I, University of Florida was all male there. It was? Yeah. And Tallahassee or Florida State was Florida State College for women. It was a long 150-mile drive, I can tell you, on Model A Ford. Anyway, so then when the war was declared, I, I got the first set of orders out of there. Went you, to radar school. Do you recall on December 7th what you were doing when you first found out? I was up in Birmingham chasing the girls or something, and I <laughs> driving home. And I hadn't had much sleep, so I pulled over the side of the road, and when I woke up and started driving again, well, I came over the radio, and I said, oh, that's it. That's me. <laughs> but I went to radar school, and they didn't have any radar, so that didn't amount to much. And then I, I shipped out, uh, I think, in March. I, my memory on dates is not too good. But there were 25 of us that shipped out, and I made first lieutenant on the dock in San Diego. And they, when I got to Eva, they did the damnedest thing I've ever heard the Marine Corps do. They, they started two, four, six, eight, ten instead of one, three, five, seven, nine, which they always start one, three. And I was one because I was the first lieutenant. And uh, the five of us stayed there, the, the one, three, five, and uh, the other twenty-five, uh, the other twenty went to Midway. And I think it was about a week or ten days, uh, three of them came back. Jeez. And, uh, now, okay, this is, this would be when, then? What, uh, what, uh, 1942. Oh, by about 40. Battle of Midway. Battle of Midway, yeah, right. But when you first went to San Diego, which was in, well, 40, uh, yeah, 42. It was about, I don't know. Were you, April or were you assigned to a, a, a ship, a carrier, or...? Oh, we went out there on a, a troop transport thing. And where did you end up when you went out? Eva. That's Eva. what I was telling Oh, you. okay. I, that's, I, miss, I missed that. Now, where is, where is Eva? In... Eva is a big, former big field that, right there by Pearl Harbor. Okay. But it was a Marine Corps field. Okay. So it's you're in Hawaii and the great. Around. The great brains of the Navy building. Our field was here, and they built they built another one right here. So, so this was Navy. And this, I mean, it was the dumbest damn thing. Because when we took off, we took off right over their field, and if they were taken off, well, we couldn't see them. And yeah. So finally, they gave us uh, the one over on the other side of the island, that, uh, and they just closed this heaven down. And, I see. But this on Oahu? Yeah. Yeah. That's right there. Right. Pearl Harbor. Right back Fort Island, yeah. Uh, so a, a bunch of the guys in, and what outfit were you in then? Well, 223. 223, okay. And uh, and who was your... Uh, see ya. Who was your see John Smith. Smith. John Smith, right. Marion Carl. Right. And so who were some of the guys that went to Midway, Midway Island then? Oh, Slim Irwin, the only one I really remember. He yeah. came back. Yeah. He lived an he lived an absolutely unbelievable life. He uh, he was a kind of an alcoholic and 
very mild, meek guy, and uh, he lived through that. And one of the generals, uh, our colonel in the Marine Corps, kicked 15 pilots off into a hurricane in the South Pacific, and only 14 of them went down. And Slim lived through that. Oh. And they, they took the, the general and packed to Washington and put him in an office with no windows and told him <laughs> to come out. Anyway, well, and uh, we trained yeah, well, day okay. and night. But, well, okay, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong now, but as I understand it, the um, we had broken a part of the Japanese code and had determined that Midway was going to be where they were going to attack to draw our carriers out, and so we were beefing it up, and that's I assume that's why they sent some of you guys out. Well, there. Midway was a Marine field. So they sent everybody out there, almost, except just a few. Right. And they had them in Brewster Buffaloes and all right. kinds of crap, and, <laughs> and the Japs just shot the hell out of them. In fact, this same Slim Irwin, he, he was flying with guys with 20 years in aviation and, and like that, and he did, they made a dive uh, on the ship or something, and, or on planes, and uh, he didn't know enough to pull out to the left. He pulled out to the right. They never heard from the other five. And Slim, it, we always teach him about a, a cross-eyed Jap, got him and shot at him all the way back to Midway. <laughs> and never did hit him, and he jumped out of the plane and made the 100-yard record with a shoot on the running. <laughs> uh, but he lived through that, too. In fact, he just died recently. So you guys were back there training? And day and night. Six hours in the daytime and two hours at night. Okay, and you're flying Wildcats now? Well, we're flying Buffaloes, Still buffaloes. and, and S, uh, F3Fs. Tell me the problem with the Buffalo. <laughs> it's a Brewster Buffalo. It's like an old woman that <laughs> is old. <laughs> They didn't last very long in the Battle of Midway. No, I know that. They yeah. just, that was just absolute murder to send those guys up there. But they didn't have anything else. Right. Yeah. Was it too slow? Was that the problem? Too oh, slow? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Old, old, old plane. I mean, right. it, it was just terrible. When, when did you get your Wildcats then, the F4Fs? Well, just before we left. We shoved off, let's see, I guess we went in there in August, didn't we? Uh -huh. And uh, so we shoved off about in July, and we got them. We, we that, got them about. That's going into Guava Canal, you're Yeah, about. we got them about May, and then we checked out on carrier landings, and so we could fly off of carriers. And then we got on, they loaded us by crane onto the, Good ship Long Island, which was a carrier they called it, but it was a railroad ferry. They put, I think it was 15 to 20 thousand tons of concrete in the bottom of it to hold it down, <laughs> and then he put another deck on it for the ship, for the planes to land on. And we set off to attack the Japs, and uh, we. Uh, we used to bet the radar guy that we could spot the plane and drop messages before he could pick them up on the radar, and we could. But, uh, we never lost that bet. That's how good the radar was. But we had a, oh, we had a lot of protection, too. We had a four-stacker destroyer from World War I. And we're, going, we're the first ones going off to attack the Japs. At Guadalcanal? At Guadalcanal. We didn't know that. We knew we were going to attack them, but we didn't know where. But, uh, so it was quite a quite a scary fleet, of two <laughs> ships. Two ships. <laughs> so we went into a body, and, they, and then they. That's where uh, Indian Payne, Joe, Payne and those guys were. Indian Joe was, there. was there. Yeah. He went to Joe see Bauer. Yeah. Right. Payne was the exact. Mm -hmm. 
and I stayed there in the hospital a few days, a week or so, and then they they went to the Long Island out, and it got within about 150 miles of Guadalcanal, and it it was turning around leaving before the the last plane was off because they didn't want any part of that stuff. <laughs> Who were some of the guys going in in that group, coming out of that point, the Long Island? Uh, same, just the same guys that we came down there with. Uh, Fred and Goot was there, and he's my was my wingman when I got there. And he lives here part of the year. He was at that thing. Oh, was he? Yeah. And uh, Ike Winters, he was. A, and and you were also. Yeah. In, in that group, okay, you guys. No, I didn't. I didn't go in on the carry. I was in the hospital. Oh, you were in the hospital. With so I went up there about a week or so later. No. I had some kind of fever. They didn't know what it was. Now Payne and those guys went on the wasp, didn't they? Well, I don't know about all that stuff oh, okay. that Payne talks about. That <laughs> was after I left. And, okay. Yeah. And I all I know. Remember is that Indian Joe and Cowboy Stout and those boys guys used to sneak up there because they wanted to fight, and they'd sneak up to Guadalcanal. And so we had an interesting captain uh, in the army. He uh, he he convinced his CO that they ought to know more about carrier flying in the, in the Air Force, in the Army Air Corps, and uh, he uh, and he got the Navy to accept him. He went aboard the carrier. I've forgotten whether it was Saratoga or what. Anyway, he uh, maybe it was probably the Enterprise, and uh, he flew with them. And he said, "You know, no rank. I'm a captain, but I want to play tail end Charlie." Well, he everybody loved him. He learned to he checked out on carriers, and he came down near Guadalcanal. He finally said to the Navy, "He said, hell, you're never going to fight." You know, that's when they abandoned us and wouldn't let us get our food or ammunition or anything. And Dirty Admiral. And uh, and uh, so he, he flew into Guadalcanal and he came into our squadron. Well, by that time, we only had about seven or eight planes. We still had maybe nine or ten, twelve, eleven pilots. So we were flying every other day. So, he, but he got my plane. He, he and I alternated. Mm -hmm. And so the army, by this time, they were chasing him real hard, trying to get him to come back because he had so much knowledge about what was going on out there. And he was hiding from them. And he keep dodging the general who was getting orders from the army to ship him out. Anyway, the last day he could make it. He it was my day, and he pushed me down and <laughs> said, no way, I'm going. And so he took off, and he, when he's checking the bags, he forgot to turn them back to both. He left it on one bag. Then he leaves me that plane, and it, it would never get, it was always about five to 7,000 feet below everybody else. And it gets kind of lonesome down there by yourself. But Okay, you're talking about magnetos. Uh, tell me what what's the function of a magneto? Well, that's a spark plug. <laughs> Fires and pistons. Uh -huh. And well, he not spark plug really, but fire the piston. Anyway, he's a wonderful guy, and he was promoted to uh, from captain to full colonel. He's the only guy I ever saw a sailor salute willingly, and he was in San Diego with a squadron of P-38s, and he was a full colonel, and they'd salute him and say, hi, Captain John, because they all knew him from, <laughs> yeah. from being aboard ship. Yeah. And he tried to teach those guys in P-38s an overhead pass, but he just couldn't get them to do it. He just, he just wouldn't dive that thing, and he'd get so upset with because he learned the overhead pass. And, this might be a good. Let's talk about the Wildcat because that's that's what you flew there yeah. uh, primarily, did you not? Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not a technician. I don't know much. About I, no, I don't. No, I'm not that so much. I want you to. First of all, I just want to 
hone in on it here a little bit, and you kind of take a little bit of a look at it too. And I want you to tell me a little bit about the tactics that you used with that particular plane, and and why they worked for you or why not. Well, uh, we always said, uh, and the wildcat. You didn't fly the wildcat. You just got along with it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like a mean woman. You you, you just couldn't fly it. You just got along. That's all. He had so damn much torque in it that you could always tell a. Uh, F for F pilot by the, his right leg was a lot bigger than his left leg. <laughs> and, and, and what about and that? It absolutely, absolutely ground loop uh, any possible way. You could figure out something, the way to ground loop it. Very narrow, very narrow landing gear. Right yeah. And, and, and you, if you slam the throttle on the thing, and jump like that. And, it, and uh, we had a funny experience like that. Uh, Colonel thought he'd never flown one, and he thought he'd come out and fly one and check it out. And he, he got it, he, he got, he got it up, and he, and he, he got it up and slammed the throttle on the thing, jumped like that, and scared him so bad he went around the field, landed, that he wouldn't even taxi it back. He jumped out at the end of the run <laughs> and, and walked back. <laughs> but that's how, how bad it was. And you had a crank, I understand. You had to crank up the That's right. Yeah, you had to crank. <laughs> now, tell us about this airplane. Is it for one man? This one here. That's the Hellcat. The Could Wildcat is the very top. They're all single seaters. Oh, yes. That's, that's, it. That's, it. Yeah, that's it. Where are your guns? Where in the wings. Oh, you have eight? Six. Six fifty caliber. And could you shoot them all with one trigger? Yeah. They all fired at one time. But you had to be directly in back of what you wanted to hit. You oh. couldn't move the guns. Oh, no, no. And they converged, yeah. which the Jap guns didn't do. What, what, oh. uh, at what range would they converge? Well, what did he say the other day? About uh, 750 yards. That's what I was thinking. I, I didn't hear him, but uh, by that, yeah. you got six guns, and you want them to all kind of come together at a certain all point. Come. That's hopefully where you hit the guy, because that's the most uh, yeah. going into yeah, it. They come together, and that's why uh, Andy and Joe said, if you can't hit them with one, you can't hit them with six. Because <laughs> you're not, you're not converging right there. Well, the Japanese guns, I got uh, shot down on my first flight, uh, shot up or whatever. Their guns went straight ahead like that, and they had four uh, small guns and a cannon in the middle. And I pulled out of our flight, which Smitty gave us this talk, which made a lot of sense. He's, you know, this is just like the Battle of Britain. He said, we've got, uh, we've got 36 planes, and they've got 700 plus. And he said, if everybody shoots down 10, and gets shot down by we shoot down 360, and they still got 360, and we ain't got any. So he said, I don't want you fooling with those zeros. Leave them alone. We're here to protect the ground troops. The bombers are the only ones that affect the ground troops. You go after the bombers and leave the zeros alone. Run or do whatever you have to do. First thing I did was I, the guy kept teasing, so I pulled off and shot him, and and I always thought he was very popular because they jumped all over me. <laughs> and he, I could see the, the bullets going in my wings on each side. I knew that I was right in the middle of the, for that cannon and it went off. And it uh, went through the star on one side and it was a high explosive. And uh, it, we counted 52 holes in the star on the other side. And 19 holes in the battery that was right at my rear end, and I didn't get touched. And I put it in a dive, and he followed me quite a ways down. But that's the one thing we could do better than a zero was dive. But you can run out of that. Uh, you're a heavier plane. You got a heavier yeah, plane. Yeah, Way faster. In a dive? No, in, in, when you were going oh, straight. Oh hell, no! We were a lot slower, and they could turn inside of us. And it was the, and yeah. it had every kind of armament on it. It just it was just loaded like a Mack truck. Well, the zero had no armor. That's why they were so maneuverable. Yeah. 
Yeah, and but they, like you say, you didn't take a lot to flame a zero, did it? No. They didn't have self-sealing gas tanks uh, that you no, guys did. No, they they went for no weight, and we went for all the weight you could get. I mean. <laughs> no heavy medium. Uh, yeah. Not between you, the two. Do you wish you would have had a cannon? No. Oh, those six fifties are wonderful. They are devastating. Hell, with uh, suck a destroyer out there with them. Yeah. That's the only time an airplane ever suck a, a capital ship. They just cut the bottom right out of it. Just flew right around it like that. Hmm. On both sides, cut the bottom out. And so what your tactics then, since they, they're more maneuverable, they're quicker than you. Leave them alone. <laughs> but if you can't leave them alone, then, well, then you have to do the best you can. Try and dive, get above them, I, I would assume, and dive through them and get a no, few shots off. You don't do that. You don't even do that. You don't do that. You leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bombers were the twin engine Bettys. Yeah. That, is that correct? That's who you dive on. And, and you were just talking about an overhead pass. Describe that to me. Well, I thought the fellow described it very poorly the other day, but it's when you you try to approach head on to this airplane. And you're above and he's below. You're above and he's below. Yeah. And you roll over on your back. Okay. And then you try to be going absolutely vertical when you pass his tail. And you shoot him all the way here. Okay. Just kind of walk along. And you, you know, you try to get within. 50 feet of his tail if you can. But Howard, the way you've described it, You're would he be going straight or would he, he would he veer off? No, he doesn't veer off. Bombers fly in a straight line. Ah. And he probably doesn't have time. Yeah, They're coming he in really fast. He, he doesn't know you're coming after him much anyway. He's looking up, but he can see you over on your back. He doesn't, there's nothing he can do about it. If he veered, you'd veer too. And which gunner that he on that plane is most uh, would cause Nobody, you the most that's trouble. That's why you do it that way. Nobody's got a shot at you. And that's why it was such a wonderful maneuver and that's why the Army CO was trying to teach his P-38 guys. Right. They were afraid that, that they had some funny thoughts that, that, uh, that if they had to bail out that a race and the tail would kill them or the tail would come off or some damn thing. I don't know. They were just spooked and that was probably as good a fighter as it was in the war. Now that first time when you got all shot up, you made it back and you were able to land your plane? Yes. Okay. And then I think it was worse than getting shot it was Smitty chewing my ass out. And I mean <laughs> I mean, I got it, buddy. <laughs> and it was just as bad as getting shot down. He's talking about John Smith, and he's on the cover of one of the Life magazines that we have, so you'll have to read the article about him. Yeah. He was the C your CEO. 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 Yeah. Right. CEO. yeah. yeah. He was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, and he, I think they gave one to the guy before him, but was shot down. And I don't know what he was doing, but oh, Colin Kelly, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, Smitty was the first one. To, yeah. He shot down 19 planes. Mary and Carl shot down 17. Got shot down. They got shot down once, and he was he landed in the jungles, and he took him three days to get back. And he was quite ingenious in getting back, but. He tried to get the general to ground Smitty for three days so he could <laughs> catch up for passing. Right. <laughs> so uh, tell me about some of your other uh, uh, flights and missions. Well, we, we, uh, you know, we, we flew. They came down every day. And, and they would come, be coming down from Bougainville? Yeah, or Rabaul. Right. And how much? How much time could they hang around the area? Well, they at first not very much, but later they started coming in with, with drop tanks, you know, fuel yeah. tanks on the wings. But, uh, and they, you know, as that fellow said the other day, he said they have a whole different approach to life. They, you know, if you run out of gas, too bad. You, 
die for your country. But uh, and they don't they didn't try any way to save them or have any fields for them to land on or anything, and they controlled all of them. All right, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did you feel a sense of admiration or hatred for these Japanese pilots? How did you feel about them? I don't know. You didn't really think about it that way so much, I don't think. You were just, you were scared and you were, uh, well, i tell you, uh, uh, that fellow said the other day, he said he just, it was such a, he, he saw the guy's head and he, he just hesitated to shoot him because he was another human being. But uh, we went up, we, if we were leaving, we got our orders to leave, but then they were bringing 40,000 troops down. So they were, we were flying down there, you know, just from before daylight to after dark, and uh, going after them. And uh, the, uh, we went up one time, and we, the, the general said he wanted the fighters to dive on the destroyers and cruisers to draw the AA fire to them so that the dive bombers could get in better. Well, we didn't take much of that approach. And uh, the Army had some planes there, and they were going to fly cover. Well, there was a bunch of little old float planes and biplanes and crap came up. And the Army goes after them, and they're just shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, and nothing's happening. So Smitty through us in a wing around. We made one pass through there and shot all 12 of them down, I guess. And so and then we, <laughs> so we got back to Army and said, you know, what's wrong with us? We can't, why can't we shoot? And we found out they'd never shot at a moving target. They'd always shot at a stationary target in a lake. <laughs> I gotta go eat. Yeah. Sure. Uh, You're still. <laughs> right. He's quite a character, isn't he? You want me to hold it up so you don't have to move that thing up and down? No, that's okay. No. <laughs> He's quite a character. Well, he belongs to a, a group of guys over in Scottsdale, and I lived over there and, yeah. and flew with a corporation for years, and, and they were all in the same Bible study oh, where group. Uh -huh. Which he was a member of, right? And uh, they all went hunting together and fishing together, and yeah. and uh, oh, that's great. So I had a lot of opportunities to sit and talk, you know. Yeah. He and I were two weeks apart. I was two weeks ahead of him. In flight training. Yeah. Yeah. And then his squadron relieved our squadron. Then he came back to Santa Barbara. I came back to El Toro. He came back to Santa Barbara. Yeah, he had an F-4U squadron there at Santa Barbara. That's right, that's right. And I came back to El Toro and was operations and... Well, he yeah. told me... Okay, uh, okay let's, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's go ahead. I've got it running here now. So we're going to pick up here with Howard Marvin. Uh, and uh, Harry Ziegler is, uh, is going to help with the interview today. And go ahead and put that back up there. And what I want to focus in on here... Here, where we had it? There we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is... Uh, John Smith, who was Howard's CO over on Guadalcanal, and I believe Smith was, he was, a, was he the first ace from the Marine Corps in uh, World War II? I think so. I think so, because this is a Life magazine that we have here in the museum. It's December 7th, 1942, and it says Marine Ace Smith, so. He was uh, a Congressional Medal of okay, Honor winner, good. too. So. Oh, did he really? That's good, Harry. Yeah. And, um, so, and you guys were discussing Joe Foss, I believe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the reason why, I, I, when you said Joe Foss went to uh, Santa Barbara when we were chatting, you know, he'd been on that bond tour. Yes. And uh, he uh, was telling the guys about all the movie stars and directors and people he had yeah. met. And so the lieutenants in the squad said, well, if you know all these hotshot Hollywood people, how about getting us some movie star dates? Well, one day the ready room phone rings, and it's a gal out at the gate saying she was here to see some of the lieutenants that, uh, in the squadron that Foss uh, had asked them to come. So right. he says, well, I need four lieutenants to go out to the gate. Well, one of them was Norm Gorley. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so 
So they jump in the car and they run out to the gate, and it's Jane Russell. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> With three other girls oh, coming in oh. due to Joe Foss. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so um, he did He did keep his word for him. <laughs> now, where well, did you leave Okay, off? well, I was just going to say, pretty much just getting into Guadalcanal. So I think it'd probably be good if you maybe start when you first got there and first really? your combat and stuff like that. I think we had pretty much got up to there. So, um, I thought, he is, yeah, go ahead. Do you think that's where we were? I think so. Just gotten there? Well, we've been there a little while, but he'd like to hear a little bit about it, too. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so just so we don't miss anything, kind of, do uh, uh, you remember the date that you got in, into the canal? Oh, let's see. We went in August of, I forgot, 20th or something yeah. like that. 1942, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I was... I had I was in the hospital in Ifati, so I was a few days late getting there. When I got off the, I had a got off the uh, transport that brought me in. I had the parachute bag with a uh, gallon of ten high bourbon, and uh, an enlisted man said, an old sergeant said to me, "You got any whiskey, Lieutenant?" And I said, yeah, my, he said, I'm paying $200 a fifth. Well, it was to be $1,000, and I had never, ever seen, heard of $1,000 in all my life. I'd never had that much money. And, uh, and I thought about it quite a while, and finally I just couldn't, couldn't do it. I set it up on the, up on the, that uh, coil thing we used for a table, or a spool. That they had to have. Wire spool? No, uh, yeah, the, the wire, big thing, uh, yeah. bigger than this table. And right this. I couldn't drink it though because it just made me sick. Think there's about a thousand dollars going down all those guys' gullets. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to leave. Now, but, did you go to a potty first, and or did you? Yes. The carrier did too. And was it one of those deals where there was just a bunch of replacement pilots on a carrier? And no, no, no. We was, were we were a first squadron to to go down to the South Pacific uh, with the intent of going after the Japs. See, Bauer was at Ifati. Uh, he was he was a first line of defense. Then he. As I recall, he opened up Esperito Santos and had a squadron in there, too, which, uh, uh, in my class, uh, good Lord, I got senior moments on memory, but, uh, he was stationed there, and they, they came into Guadalcanal after Foss, I believe, or came in as, as a, an addition that they were getting more and more fighters in there. So, when you said you came in on the transport, was that a DC-3 or a... Yeah, I think it was. So That's they just loaded you all up from... Uh, yeah, what they do is they take off on right at about dawn, and then they would uh, get in there and then uh, be out of there by 10 o'clock in the morning because the Japs didn't get there until about noon. You can pretty nearly set your watch on when the Japs would get there. <laughs> They had a long trip to make. Now, when <clears throat> when you were coming into what I would call the country, you know, yeah. into a combat area, yeah. what kind of briefings and discussions was going on at Afadi as to what were they telling you guys about Guadalcanal and what? Well, they didn't. We they didn't. We didn't have any of that. We, no briefings. Uh, no, we were all on the carrier together, and we were. I think we were two or three weeks on the carrier getting there. And the intelligence section of the ship didn't give any briefings? Well, no. Or, uh, they didn't go over the capabilities of the Zeros? See, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what we were going there for or anything. Because the, the landing on Guadalcanal was just a total surprise to everyone except higher up. And uh, they, they took, they just decided that the, the landing in Guadalcanal should take two weeks for the troops. And that awful admiral, what's his 
name Fleming? Or Fletcher? Fletcher, yeah. He came back and said, no, he could not have two weeks for the landing to get all the stuff off the ships. I'm talking about the ground troops now. He said, you got, I'll give you five days. And he pulled out before the end of the second day. And that's why we were, had such a terrible shortage of food, ammunition, and everything. I mean, we, we didn't have anything to eat hardly. Uh, we had some Spam, which I love. And we got one slice of Spam and one scoop of Jap rice at five in the morning and we got one slice of Spam and one scoop of Jap rice at five at night. That was our total food. The, uh, some of the enlisted men ate better because there were cattle there and horses. And we had a, a pediatrician or something for a doctor and he said the cattle had tuberculosis and we couldn't eat them. Well, hell on, 90% of the cattle have tuberculosis, I think. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the meat. And uh, so we'd sneak off and eat with the ground troops at noon sometimes. If we, we got down to the point where we had uh, we had uh, ten pilots, or nine pilots and six planes, so we didn't fly every day. When you then... Who got the airplanes from Afadi up to? Uh, we went up within 150 miles on the Long Island carrier, and they took off with the carrier, and the carrier turned around and left. So the guys that and we just flew in. So some of the guys came in on transports, and no, they all flew in except me. Because you'd been sick. I was in the hospital. Because what was that from? I damn I know what I had. Some <laughs> kind of big high temperature or something. Yeah. Then we all, of course, got malaria and turned yellow from taking adamant, was it? Hetrophine? Hey, no, it was that. What was that? Adam? Oh. I know what you're. Turned us all yellow? Yeah. Now, and we lost, everybody lost weight because we all had dysentery, too. And uh, that's a real great experience to get up to about 25,000 feet with dysentery because <laughs> you swell up pretty big. <laughs> Quite a little gas involved. <laughs> yeah, you don't know whether it's gas or not. You're not too sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, were you flying the Grumman F4F or yeah. the General Motors? No, Grumman. So you had six 50s yeah. instead yeah. of four. Yeah. And uh, when the planes went in, were they relatively new birds or were yes, they, they were pretty they were, good? They were, they were really new. We, we were very fortunate in that we got the first bunch. In fact, the thing was so secretive or whatever it was, I don't know, we had no idea we were going. And so I had the first weekend off I'd had in about three and a half or four months uh, this weekend and uh, I was staying at a, a lady's house in, uh, over in the uh, Waikiki area and uh, for the night and the next morning at breakfast the phone rang and she talked and talked to this guy, uh, someone, and, and it turned out she said to me, well, that was so-and-so, aren't you in his squadron? And I said, yeah. She said, they're shipping out. So this was Sunday morning. We didn't even, we didn't know about it on Saturday. And so, God, I ran out and jumped in the Jeep and took off. And I got back to Evan. I, uh, I dumped my, all, my, uh, all my clothes into a footlocker, just dumped them in there. And I put the footlocker in the Jeep, and I grabbed an enlisted man. I said, come with me. And I took off for Pearl Harbor. And for some reason, I was going on the back roads and 
through these cane fields, and all of a sudden I popped out on a dock, and by God, there was a Long Island, and there was my squadron. And I got on there, and I know it was not an hour before they took off. The ship and, and I, I was, you know, normally you'd go to Pearl or you'd go somewhere, but I was lost in the damn cane fields and came on this dock, which was over on one of the fingers of Pearl. Just by accident, huh? By pure accident. Had no idea where it was. <laughs> I got aboard. I think it was less than 30 minutes that they took off. <laughs> How much time was left on these? About an hour. Yeah. We so if you in. need to, you can just uh, just pop one into here, yeah. into your camera if you go, if you go past that. Oh, that's uh, okay, who, yeah. tell me who these good-looking guys are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, uh, Frazier was a great, he was a great pilot. He was really a fine pilot. And I think he eventually, he ran off the, he, he, he landed him on a real short runway in Chicago in the ice and he ran mm -hmm. off the end of the runway and was killed there. And you're the tall guy of the Mustangs, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I only had a mustache for like five days, but that would be the day they gave us the picture. I, I always wondered what I'd look like with a mustache. I, I never, I, I had it five days and shaved it off because I thought it looked terrible. <laughs> you all my pictures. Like put that on the camera? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, maybe when he, uh, and you got Smith there. And yeah. Smith there. Hughes is still living, I think. Uh -huh. uh, 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 I can't think of his name. Don't have it here. And the the reason Bob had that is three of those three of those guys live here in the desert. I believe. Well, he Goot is a winter winter. Yeah, and, I mean they're part and, of and winters. He lives over at uh, uh, Ontario or somewhere uh, over there. He came. On. But Lee's was our youngest one. He was about eighteen or nineteen years old, he was, yeah. and he was a real favorite of Smith. And he got shot down, and he went into a, a kind of a funny cane break area, a bunch of weeds and everything. No, he didn't. He didn't get. He said something went wrong. Anyway, he had to land, and he he landed in this weed, high weed area. Uh, you know, only a few of them, mostly palm trees. And he hit a ditch and broke his neck. Mm. And Smitty went in after him. It was crazy, but he did. And got him out. And that's how we knew that he that I was died. And when you say he went in after him, how'd he do it? He flew in. He landed in there and then got him and took off. Nope. That's the way I recall it. Yeah. Or they may have sent ground troops in there. Yeah, but keep, they got him out. Yeah. But they got him out because he was behind the Jap lines. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I guess Smitty just realized he was dead. I don't know why you left him off here. He, oh, it probably it. Uh, went past the the scan. Probably. Well, but funny. We'll, 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 we'll put yeah, we'll put we'll put that yeah. on. We'll and. I think Canfield's still living. I don't know about Gene's, not. but Rapid Robert Reed, he was he was a big, tall, strong guy from Oklahoma, and he'd, he'd sit and just stare at you, just like this. Never say a word, just stare at you. And it, you know, it'd drive you crazy after a while because he wouldn't say anything. And, and, uh, he, he said that he used to be a used car salesman, but he, and we said he probably sold cars to Indians. You know, you just sit and stare at them until the Indian <laughs> buy the car. But he was a fine pilot. Boy, he, he and I were in a real deep foxhole one time with a zero cape through fire uh, shells into the his, uh, palm trees and the coconut palm trees, you know, they just hit everything. It just makes a terrible racket. We were down there, we were in a, a, must have been a five or six foot deep foxhole. And I'm squatting down. I looked around and Rapid Robert is 
his spawn at the bottom of the fox hole, trying to dig it farther underneath. <laughs> but he was a great pilot and a really, really good guy. He stayed in and retired as a brigadier general, I think. Now, was that picture, where was that picture taken? Was that taken on Guadalcanal? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's not focusing. Yeah, no, I'm just looking to see if it's going to happen. That's, that's much better. Away. Yeah. yeah. So this was VMF 223? 223. 223. Yeah. yeah. Were they, let's see, 223, they became the snakes? No, we had bulldogs. I uh, did a bad thing, maybe. I uh, I was called from 223. I got a call from North Carolina, the CEO of the squadron. And uh, he told me that they had, oh, no, they sent me in writing a thing about the museum they had back there it for worked. our squadron. Where? In Cherry Point area. Oh, okay, yeah. And <coughs> So I got him on the phone and asked him if he would, you know, like to have my memorabilia from, and he said he would. So I shipped him, I had a, my wife bronzed the baseball cap that we all wore there. She bronzed mine, and, and so I still had it, and I had the, the Japanese printed uh, British currency. And, shillings and pounds and they paid the natives with it it was just terrible counterfeit nothing money you know, worth nothing worthless that's why one of the reasons the natives hated them so <laughs> and they used that all through the south pacific and i still had some of that currency and then i had some the currency uh, real japanese currency that was 50, 60, 70 years old, I, I've often wondered if, it, after I shipped it, I wondered if it, re, if it had a big high value. Yeah, it probably does as a collector. Uh, yeah. I was going through an old footlocker and I found some MPC from Japan. M you know, empty what? MPC, military payment curves. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it, which is all we could spend in, yeah. when we'd come out of Korea to Japan. Uh -huh. And uh, I often wonder, I said, wonder if it has you know, any, any other than, you know, uh, right. uh, you know, a feeling, of rem you know, memories from right. what I was using it. Right. Now, when the squadron goes in then with new airplanes, yes. uh, how many airplanes would that have been? Uh, there was 18 of them. 18. 18. And how many? No, that was eight. No, there was 16, I believe. So there would have been... Pilots. 18 pilots and 16, 16 or, and with the skipper, did he take the squadron in? Or yes. Uh -huh. And uh, who, so you had, your ground troops were already there? Yeah, they have been there about a week or so. And from the time the invasion of Guadalcanal started to when you guys landed, would have been roughly how long? About a week. About one week. Uh -huh. So the Japanese, uh, Equipment was still all over. Oh yeah. Uh, the oh, and the CBs, they were terrific. They they repaired all the big uh, steamrollers and uh, everything the Japs had. They just man, they just had it all running, and they were just doing great. They finished up the runway. The runway wasn't all finished when when the ground troops went in. That's why we were kind of a week after them. And. <clears throat> When did they build the second runway? They never did that I know of. They, we just flew out of a cow pasture, the fighters did. No. The dive bombers with their heavy load used to Henderson Field. Henderson. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't. Uh, now how did Henderson Field get its name? Well, the guy was uh, uh, killed at the Battle of Midway. He, he dove it right down the stack of carrier, Jap carrier. And so Henderson was named After from a him. Navy pilot? No, I think it was a Marine. A Marine who, who, who... See, we were on the battle, we were in the battle of Medway Big. I was, I made first lieutenant in San Diego as we shipped out. And there was 25 of us. And 
So I was a senior officer, first lieutenant. And when we got to Midway, they did a thing that I have never heard of in the service. And instead of starting, they had everybody listed one, two, three, four. Instead of starting with one, three, five, seven, and nine, they took two, four, six, eight, ten, and then all the rest. So the five that were one, three, five, seven, and nine stayed at Evan, and the other twenty went to the Battle of Midway. And about six days or seven days later, I think, three of them came back. That's how many were gone. Now, did they? And I missed that. <laughs> because you were one Because of the, they chose. The odd, you were an odd number. Yeah, I was one because I was a first lieutenant. Oh, the, the other 24 were second lieutenant. So it was it by date of rank? Is that how they? Well, that's how you, they list you in the, in the order that you, yeah. By date of rank? Probably, yeah. yeah. Now, then. Did those guys go aboard ship to? No, they were flown out there. They, they were? They, yeah, they were flown out there. So they were land-based at Midway? Yeah. And so they were part I guess some of them went by ship because they uh, they were flying Brewster Buffaloes, so they never had a chance. Most of them had never even seen a Brewster Buffalo, and they first combat but <laughs> that that was just a so that. that was then when the Japanese went in with their first wave to bomb Midway yeah. these were the guys that went up to intercept them well yeah and they and they attacked the carriers too they went out after them this friend of mine Slim Irwin he lived a magic life he he was one of the three or five that came back and uh, he he, this Jap, we always said was a cross-eyed Jap because he, he picked him up. They made a dive that was six of them. He didn't know enough to pull out to the left. He pulled out to the right. And these guys that he was flying with were 20-year veterans in the Marine Corps. And, you know, they, they would have been generals in another year, so they had that much time in. And, uh, and, uh, he pulled out to the right, and they never heard from the other five guys again. And this one Jap picked him up and shot him all the way back to Midway from the Jap fleet. And he landed with the guy shooting him. And we kidded him that he made, he broke the 100 yard record of running with a shoot to get, to get into a foxhole. But he lived, he was one of the guys that lived through it. And they, one other one, they they kicked uh, general. Said, "Ah, oh, hell, typhoons. They don't mean anything to the Marine Corps." He kicked uh, 15 uh, U's off to go from one island, another island, to another island in a typhoon type storm. And only one of them got through, and that was slim. The other 14 went went down. I remember that story. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that general was taken back to Washington and put in a room with no windows and given a newspaper and told him not to come out. <laughs> so you're, you then told a story then about how you were at the home and ended up just basically finding out that you were going. Well, you know, that they Sunday. didn't even know it the day before when I, when I was given the two days leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so that takes us back to you going ashore a week after Guadalcanal was invaded and what kind of facilities did you go into then if the island invasion was one week old? Or, oh, what, what did they have, you know, set up for you guys to live in? Oh, nothing. We just tents. We uh, Jap tents and that kind of thing. We had some of our own tents. But they were, and we had, and they had some cots. Well, we had cots and we had some mosquito netting. And so that, of course, it was just, it was, the mos 
mosquitoes would just carry you away down there. If you, you know, if you would roll up against the netting at night <laughs> where they could get at you, you wet, the next morning you'd be looked like you had the measles. <laughs> now, what time of year was this again? August. And what was the weather like? Just terrible, hot and sticky. Yeah. Now, how did you guys? What did you have there to service the airplanes, like refueling them? And we had what, 50 two-gallon drums with pump on them. And, and uh, so it was all hand. Oh yes. And uh, do you remember how many drums it took to fill up your airplane? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> But then the terrible, uh, the worst thing was not the Jap bombing and strafing, but it was the shelling from the from the battle wagons and things. You just you just can't believe what it's like to where they just they rake you, what they call it, I guess. They, they start here and they go out maybe 150 or 200 yards, and then they come back at the, where the shells are exploding every. And I think it is, it's really bad. Now, did and you have... The don't do any good because they were 12, 14 inch shells. They'd go down the ground maybe 30 or 40 feet and blow up, you know. So did you lose a lot of pilots that no, way? No, they, for some, we lost a lot of airplanes that way. Somehow mm -hmm. they couldn't get us that way. Now. Did you have warnings that the Japanese were going to shell, or did you wait until the first round hit, and that was a, that was a warning? <laughs> That's right. That was a warning. Then we had another thing, an old twin-engine plane that the Japs had float plane. It came in every night. And we called him Maytag Charlie because of the sound of his engine sound like a Maytag washing machine. And he'd fly around and around, and he had two 100-pound bombs. And he'd get so disgusted with him, because, you know, he's not going to do much damage with them, but he wouldn't drop them. He'd just wreck your sleep and, <laughs> you know, you get out of a cot and a mosquito netting and jump in a mud hole, foxhole. You're so covered with mud and everything when you get back in your, in your bed, in your cot, that you just ruin everything. <laughs> and we didn't have too good laundry there. We washed our clothes and ourselves in the Lunga River. <laughs> now, from the time you got there, uh, what was the beginning of your first combat? Well, can you remember that first time yes. you flew? Uh, as I told you before, Smitty explained to us how many planes they had and everything. Leave the zeros alone. So on the first flight, the zero kept fiddling at me and fiddling at me. I was in formation with Smitty, and uh, I just pulled off and shot him. And he was very popular, I guess, because about four or five of them came right after me. And I, I was, I couldn't get back with Smitty, and I, uh, so I was alone and. I could see and feel these 7.7 .7 shells going into each wing, and I knew he was going to turn the cannon on in a minute. And he turned it on, and he hit me right in the star on the right-hand side of the, of the plane. And on the wing or fuselage? In the fuselage. Because uh -huh. his four 7.7s seven uh, shoot straight ahead, so they were hitting each wing. I knew he was right on. And he, so, when, when I, uh, so I pushed it over, and that's the only thing a Grumman could do better than a zero was dive. And you can run out of diving. And I can tell you that it was right up against the stop, and I was going like this, trying to get it to go a little faster. And I got in a cloud cover and, and uh, lost a guy, and I came back. It was uh, 19 holes in the battery that was right behind my rear end. And there was 52 holes in the star on the other side. He hit me with a high explosive shell, I guess. And, uh, but I'll tell you, 
honestly, that getting shot like that was not as bad as the chewing out that Smitty gave me. I mean, he has chewed me out from one end to the other for losing that airplane. So I never, I got the picture of this. <laughs> I, I'm a little slow to get it. But. So you got a kill out of that? Yeah. You got one zero? On, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, can you remember any of your, your feelings when you sat there getting ready to shove the power on on the first hop in combat? <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you remember any? I don't. I don't recall anything. We just, we were young and we just took it as something that was happening to us, I, I think. I mean, almost all of us. There's some good pictures of us sitting around. I've got a couple that I want to bring and give them to you. Sitting around at night, you know, just talking. And our, our, uh, the Navy is allowed to give you two, two or four ounces of whiskey, I think. In, in emergency situations or combat. So when we would have a bad day and lose somebody or two or three, he would give us a booze to drink at night, which we all enjoyed, not a lot of it, but you know, we drink two or three ounces. Well, at that age, hell, you can drink that much and have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but when we had a big day, and we, you know, got quite a few kills, all elated, he wouldn't let us have any. <laughs> There's only other sad, bad days. Now, were you the only squadron? No. Uh, uh, 224 was there. And who was the CO, if you remember, 224? Bauer. So I mean, uh, uh, Gaylor. Gaylor. Yeah. And um, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, too. And uh, Smitty did not believe in medals. He didn't even he didn't even get Marion Carl his Navy Cross. Navy he Marion Cross should have had the Congressional Medal of Honor too. He he uh, but no one in the squadron got a, any medal. Didn't get even an air medal. Nothing. They must have been awarded later. No. Mm -hmm. Only one guy. Uh, Fraser there, he shot down 11 planes and they finally gave him the Navy Cross. You know, one his CO later found out about it. But not one person ever got it. And the Army, <laughs> they, they'd fly up there in the morning and be gone by 10 o'clock and, and every time they flew up there, they, every five times they'd give them an air uh, they they'd give them an air medal on every trip and they'd give them Distinguished flying cross after they had five trips. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, none of us ever got anything. Well, it would appear to me because of the, the award system later on, which was really prostrated in Vietnam because of the helicopters. Yeah. And you know, we had helicopter guys over there with, with 100 air medals. Yeah. You know, because right. it, every right. time they took off and landed, it was a mission. That's and right. And they take off eight and ten times a day, <laughs> yeah. you know, going from one place to another. Yeah. So, uh, I've never heard that. That's that's interesting, but I bet that happened. Sure. Well, it, it just the whole ward system got, yeah, you know, upside it down. And really, everything. really messed up. But the Air Force was big for doing that. They, now, you're how long into this uh, before you get into your second combat with the Jap airplane? Oh. We almost every day, if you if you were flying that day, we you, they were kind of, you know the only time they didn't come was bad weather, and uh, we had an inch and we had a, see the fleet was about 300 miles offshore and they wouldn't come near us. They were so afraid because of the terrible kicking they had taken there between those islands at Guadalcanal. It's the worst defeat the Navy's ever had. And they weren't coming back. And they didn't give a damn. And now, and I was reading the other day that one of the admirals in, in Pearl and MacArthur and one of the generals in Washington considered us a lost cause. And they were not going to send good after bad. <laughs> and 
they decided that there was no way that we could hold out there. And so they abandoned us. And I didn't ever know that until the other day. And then I understand that part of the ground troops were given a bag and they threw in the ammunition and some food. And they said, that's it. That's all there is, there isn't any more. And the uh, Japs landed, I think it was to the west of us, northwest of what we had. And for some reason, this story was very good. The Jap uh, commanding officer marched them all the way around our position in the jungle. It took five days to get around us. We had two miles by five miles. And the walking isn't too easy there because there aren't any trails there. They didn't have much food when they started on this thing. And I don't know how many thousand of them there were, but there were a ton of them. And when they got over here, then they attacked. After five days of very little food and drink, drinking rainwater and stuff. Well, they were so weak and everything that that bloody nose ridge and all that was. They, I mean, they got into hand-to-hand -to -hand combat there. And when we defeated them, that Halsey took over, and that's when he came charging in there. He was he wasn't like that. Fletcher guy, or what is it? Uh, he was just he was just terrible, but he is the one that caused it. So when we held out on that, when the Marine Corps held out there, I was not there then. I'd been relieved, but uh, that was a, when they came. And then they came with everything, you know, plenty of planes and plenty of everything. So <clears throat> when did you have your second? against the Japs. When did you shoot down your second? Well, we, uh, well, I thought I shot another one down, but I, I don't know. Anyway, we, I got credit on the ground for it, but I didn't see it <laughs> go down. Anyhow, we went, we, the Jap fleet was coming down with 40,000 new troops. And so the, the general said, you know, we got to go after them. And we started flying almost around the clock. I mean, we'd, we'd take off so we'd get there at daylight and we'd leave there. And we were yelling that we had our orders. We we got our orders. We're supposed to leave. We got our orders. He didn't pay too much attention to us. So we, he said, he called us in and he said, what I want you to do is I want the fighters to dive on the, on the capital ships. And, and use your machine guns, and uh, then I want, so the, 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 any aircraft will fire at them, and then dive bombers will be able to get in without too much trouble. Well, we, we didn't think too much of that. <laughs> Especially when we had our orders in our pocket to go, and uh, so uh, we, 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 the dive bombers, and we went up there, and there was some, uh, Army guys there by this time, P-40s, and they were red hot. They, when we take off after the Japs, if they didn't find them, they would make runs at us to try to play, you know, play combat. And boy, I'm telling you, we chewed them out good. So they were to fly air cover for us, and we were to dive on the ships, and and then the dive bomb. Well, uh, up came these float planes and stuff. We went up north to, for, to catch these troop ships before they got there. And uh, they, uh, they, they uh, there was, I think, there was eight of us. And here up comes these float planes and things of the Japs. And the Army was to take care of them. And they went after them, and they were firing and just doing all kinds of maneuvers and everything and not anything happening. So finally Smitty just put us out in line and we 
made a 360 degree turn. We shot down all 12 of them. <laughs> I got a, one of them and he jumped out to right in front of me. And I thought, I, I can't shoot him. I mean, I just, you know, it's different than ground troops, isn't yeah. it? You, yeah. you flown, it's different. I just couldn't shoot him, but he went down a long way from shore anyway. <laughs> But uh, that, that one I got to, uh, and then and then we uh, had, had a little problem with navigation coming home, and so I turned it over to my wingman because I, I after you after you've been in you know chasing planes a little bit and everything, you don't know exactly where you are. You don't know where you're starting from, <laughs> and. Uh, so I turned, I turned it over to him, and he flew for about 30 or 40 minutes. And I, I just had a feeling that it was wrong. And I took over and and uh, changed about 30 degrees. And in about an hour, we hit Guadalcanal right on the nose. Because uh, so many planes, you know, you miss one of those islands. Yeah. You just, there's nothing out there. You just keep fly it or circle it or do it something, but if you, if you miss it, you usually, because a lot of those B-17s even got lost, would go down. Well, so you got later on credit for half a kill or? No, I got a whole kill there. So, so you got a whole kill on the, the float plane. Yeah, and, that's um, the only two I shot down. Now you could, when you were firing at this guy, could you see where your rounds were going? Oh, sure. Where, where, where were the where tracers? Did, yeah. Where did you? Uh, what's? I what, hit him right the engine. There was right it. the engine. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, a twin engine float plate, they they too hard to hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what happened was the army when they came back, they were really disgusted with themselves. They said, "What's wrong with us? You know, we can't shoot it. We can't hit anything." So well, then we found out that they had never fired at a moving target. They had targets set up in lakes, you know, and they'd shoot at them. And But they never fired, and then didn't know how to lead. Uh, no deflection or anything? Yeah, no. So, don't you think this is about enough? <laughs> <laughs> you mean on our discussion now? No, oh. no just the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> well then... Well, I, I was going to tell you about coming home. Well, you... So, let me see if I got the. So, other than two confirmed, you never uh, got anything after that. No. And when um, you went to dive on the battleships, uh, yeah. the capital ships, what happened in in that routine? Well, that was nothing happened to anybody. Nobody got hit. No one got. And they, they, they uh, got the transports, and then. Uh, 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 Lost of squadron came in, and they went after them too. And uh, they sunk a destroyer with those 60, 650 calibers. They cut the bottom right out of it. First, they rigged the deck and stopped all uh, anti-aircraft. And then they started around the water line and cut the bottom out of it. That's the first time a fighter they were sunk in a capital, capital ship. Hmm. But they got all of those 40,000 gems. That water, you couldn't believe it. It looked like somebody poured a glass in an anthill. The sea was just full of them. They, they were so thick on those on those transports that they could hardly sit down. They were standing on the decks and below decks and everywhere. And when you sink one of them, it just be thousands of them in the water. They got one, one ship to go out of canal with about 600 men on it. That's all that ever got there, out of that 40,000. Wow. So that set them back quite a little. I was uh, going back to Midway. I was reading where the Japanese pilots that were in that, oh. um, they put them in barracks and 
didn't let them out because they didn't want the Japanese people to know what had happened at the Battle of Midway. They didn't want any of the pilots that were left yeah. talking about how bad the defeat was. Yeah. And so they just hit them is that, away. Is that right? Yeah, so that they... Boy, that was... I think that was a real turning, big turning point of the war. Because they lost almost 400 pilots, I think, there. Well, at what point... And they were the cream of the crop. I mean, they were the best. How long had you been there in Guadalcanal before you got orders to leave? Were they good to back to, to, uh, to the United States, the mainland? Yeah. And so how long had... We were there about six weeks. Six weeks, and you already had, is it because of the physical condition of everyone, the malaria, oh, the dysentery? Has, and dysentery. So, you know, everybody lost. I weighed, uh, I think I weighed 170 pounds. And Go ahead, I wonder. Okay. I'm, I'm a little worried about this. This uh, Coming back is, the, we got on this Liberty ship, and I was telling you, they were so far off course. But we get to San Francisco. We hadn't drawn any pay for about five months or six months almost. Just, man, just loaded with money. And we didn't have any clothes except what we had on. And, uh, and we'd been washing that in seawater for for a month. The board we'd, ship? We'd been a month on the ship. Uh -huh. So I... I Go, I take the, I think it was seven of us, and I go to the Drake Hotel, and I said, we need seven rooms. And he said, oh, <laughs> you kidding, we have got seven rooms. And, uh, and uh, so he said, but I do have this mezzanine where there's about 12 or so double beds. And he said, you can have that. So we... We go in there, and I call up room service, and I said, "Do you know what a bathtub, or what a tub is, a wash tub?" He said, "Yes." I said, "We want a wash tub of ice, because we hadn't had any ice for about three months either." One second, I'm gonna just stop okay. this and. of bourbon and a half a piece of scotch and a half a piece of gin and mixes. And we had our wings and we had some uh, overseas ribbons. And we go down to the bar and here are all the girls and all the Navy guys in their beautiful pressed uniforms and everything. And we got the amazing look at Ledge and the girls went after us like crazy. They were tired of kissing the boys hello, uh, goodbye. They wanted to kiss somebody <laughs> hello. Well, good Lord, within an hour or so, there were girls running up and down the beds and they were just having a ball. And uh, uh, I get a call on the second and third day from the, the uh, man, the, the head of the Navy. Uh, and the message is for me to call my mother. <laughs> I forgot to call my mother. <laughs> Tell her I was home. And she called the she called the war department of the navy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we we stayed there about five days, and oh gosh, we we just had the greatest time, and so with the with the girls and all, and. Uh, so I told this friend of mine about it, how wonderful it was, and all the crazy things we did, and he wrote a little book about it. And then they picked it up and they made a movie on it. Oh, what was it called? It was called Kiss the Girls for Me. Oh, and, okay. And that Cary Grant played the lead, and uh, and. Uh, but they oh. used they used the army instead of the Marine Corps. <laughs> that was our as as the 
I think it was Kiss the Girls for me or Kiss the Girls Goodbye. But they used the army and that was a dirty deal. <laughs> but I've never been able to find a print of the movie. I, I saw it once. You know, I think I've seen it on, on television, on Channel 70 once or twice. I, and you know, right? Yeah. They're all back from the war and, yeah. and they're in a hotel in San right. Francisco. That's right. Yeah. They have girls and girls. And girls, and, girls and, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, uh, now, did you have other siblings in your family that were in the service? Yes, I had a brother who was in the army. He, he, he got smart. He and I, I had a chicken farm in Miami. Carl Gables, and well, we, we were raising hatching eggs and baby chicks, and Roosevelt was paying 25 cents a piece for them in South America to restock South America, one of his weird, crazy things. So I went out to Pan Am, this old clipper ship, to see if, if I could ship some baby chicks down there. And they said, sold out for a year. Plenty of seats if you want to ride down there. But. So we talked it over, and my father said, You know, I think aviation may be here to stay. He said, Why don't you boys go in the service and learn to fly and then fly your own baby chicks down there? So I went to the Army, and they were out to lunch, and I went to the Navy and said, I'd like to find out about, you know, the aviation, getting in the Navy, flying. What the hell are you want to get in the damn Navy for? Why don't you get in the Marine Corps? It was an old hard-nosed, 25-year-old Marine captain. I said, Good morning. I said, well, I don't want to get in anything. I just want to find out about it. He says, here, take this and go to the, the infirmary over there. And so I go there, and he's a half-drunk doctor, and he sticks his finger in my one end and then the other end, and he puts it in my mouth. And says, you pass. I go back and here's a, several officers sitting around in a semicircle and they get me in the middle of it and start firing a lot of questions at me and I'm young and scared. I, they finally said, sign here. So I did. So I didn't know what they were up to. And, uh, about a week or two later they called me up and said, report out here and check into the dorm, BOQ, you're going to uh, fly for 10 hours solo. I said, you got it. you lost your damn mind. I got 3,000 chickens here that got to be fed and the eggs got to be gathered and everything. I'm not going to come out there. <laughs> they said, well, okay. They said, you just be sure you're here every morning at 730. <laughs> so I was, I stayed out and took care of my chickens and, then, and went through primary <laughs> the 10 hours. What, what field would that have been? Uh, Opelika. Opelika. Yeah. And uh, so then after that, I they said, you know, you're it now, buddy. And so I had two or three months when I sold my chickens and sold them everything. Now, how about your brother? Then? Yeah, well, he, he went, got through too, and he's a good pilot. Did he? He had a little, but he's going to Pensacola. It took him about a week and a half visiting friends and drinking way too much. And, and the eye doctor got him, and he said, you know, read that chart. My brother said, what chart? You know, the smart mouth. And so in those days, they bust you out over anything. Yeah. So they busted him out. Now, what year would that have been? 1940. 40. So he went in the Air Corps. Army Air Corps. Did he fly in it? Oh yeah, he flew in the Aleutians in a rough war. That was a terrible war up there. Now, and so did he, after the Aleutians, what what happened to him? Well, he, he, uh, he, he got out, then he went back in, and later, and stayed in another, I don't know how long, and then he was in the reserve, and got his time in and drew a pension. But then he had a massive heart attack and died. Wow. <coughs> so my you other brother, he was in the paratroopers. He was much younger, but he went in after World War II. Now you, then after you 
have all this gaiety in San Francisco yeah. to drink, yeah. which is one nice hotel. Yeah, right. What what happens after that? Well, I went. Uh, I <laughs> we they took us to San Diego to give us psychological tests. Just after you've been in combat. Yeah, after two days, they told us we were all crazy and we were <laughs> crying. I'd like to take you two days to find that out. <laughs> So I went over to operations, and I said to the guy, you got anything going to the East Coast? And he said, well, can you fly a, a, a DC-4, uh, oh, oh, an old biplane? Uh, good Lord. Steering? Huh? Is it a steering? No, no, no. It was an old dive bomber. Great, big old thing. DC-1 or DC Hudson or what? Well, DC-4, you, you would DC. never know anything about it, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I said, are you kidding? I said, I can fly a box if you'll give me a big enough engine. He said, you're the man for me. So he said, be here at 7 in the morning, take this thing to Jacksonville. I, uh, so I was there, and I said, you got anybody to check me out in there? Because I, I had flown one before, but I'd been a long time. And he said, are you kidding? He said, if you, if you get it off the ground, I don't want to ever see you again. <laughs> well, I got to Ajo, Arizona, and I had a major from Guadalcanal in the back, a ground troop guy, who was a little bit off in the head because of one of those big shells had gone off underneath his foxhole and blown him up in the air. 30 or 40 feet to hit. So it catches on fire, and I look down at that desert, and I see Ajo with an airport over here, and I'm flying through a red zone. You're not supposed to to hell with that. I'll go right, I'm going a short way. So I, I tell him, I look back at him, and he's sitting, I told him to get his chute ready, and all, but we might have to leave this thing. Funny, I always had time and I looked back and he was sitting back there with his legs crossed, his seatbelt undone and smoking a cigarette. So I knew I had something for a fact. Well, I got it into Ajo, Arizona and uh, it didn't burn up. And I called a guy in San Diego and I said, you know, this thing caught on fire and, and we can't fly it anymore. He said, you stay right there, I'll send you another one. So he sent me another one, and uh, I, I blew a tire. They had to go to Philadelphia to find the tire, and you had to crank this airplane, and the Army never saw an airplane you had to crank. And uh, I, I just, everything happened to me. I met Buddy Rogers in, in Dallas, and we got weathered in, and Buddy, I, I was just standing around, the lobby there at the Adolphus Hotel, and Buddy came bouncing up the stairs and said, what's the matter, Jirene? And I said, I can't get a room. He said, come with me. So we go around the back side of the counter, and he said, I'm Buddy Rogers. And they go, ah! He said, we need two rooms. And uh, she said, oh, fine. And then going up the elevator, he said, what are you doing for dinner? And I said, I think, uh, so he said, let's go over to the baker. So we go over to the baker, and uh, they put the table right out on the dance floor with Buddy, and we had dinner early, and the girls are dancing around there with the guys, and they stopped and put a piece of paper in Buddy's pocket. After dinner, he got these papers all out. We went out and got a cab. He gave them to the cab driver. He said, you organize these. Well, I'll tell you, we'd go to these apartments, and here'd be two or three girls there waiting for us. And Buddy Rogers would take off with them, his pick. And that was the darndest three or four days I ever spent. <laughs> well, 14 days later, I'm going across the Okefenokee Swamp, and I can see Jacksonville. And the damn engine quits. <laughs> and I thought, this is dead. Go through Guadalcanal at 14 days of this damn air place. And, and, uh, but I got the wobble pump going and got it down on the ground and went to operation. 
Jones. I said, what in the world are you going to do with that airplane? He said, see that barge out there? He said, we're going to put it on there and going to take it out and dump it in the ocean. I said, you mean to tell me that they can't dump that thing in the Pacific Ocean? They have to bring it over here and <laughs> damn near kill me. <laughs> but there was a plaque, two plaques on it, saltwater crash in 1932 and saltwater crash in 1934. Well, you know airplanes don't recover too well from the saltwater crash. <laughs> so, anyway, don't you think this is enough? That's enough. Uh, I, I don't want to Well, I'm just curious now. You you get out of the service. You retire yeah. from the service. Yeah. And you go into something, then what do you do? you go back to school or? No. No, I went into real estate business. Where was that? In Beverly Hills. And? I married a girl from there. And so you then work, your, you, you get out in Florida? You Is that where you mustered out or? No, I got out in uh, Los Angeles area. So they Long bring Beach. you back here to the West Coast from oh, no, no, from Opelika or from? No, no, no. I came, when I came in from overseas, I came into Long Beach. I, w I went out the second time into that night fighter group. And then but after the war was over, I came back into Long Beach. Mm -hmm. and so I was right at home. And so you met your wife there? Oh, I met her in Washington, D.C. back way before, uh -huh. it, before the, well, the war, is, let's see, I got the first orders out of Pensacola and I went to radar school and they attached me to Quantico. So I was, uh, I was, uh, when, when I got out of radar school, I went back to Quantico, that was in Norfolk, Virginia, and I went back to Quantico and the, the head of the Marine Corps uh, aviation there, somebody said, good God, three pilots. He said, that's all I need. He said, listen, you go to, you go, you go. Just out of curiosity, the one thing I didn't catch in this is you came back from uh, Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal, had your party at the yeah. Drake, and then you went. Uh, I was stationed in at Del Toro. And got. I was operations the, officer. For a night fighter squadron. No. And then I was operations officer there. Then I was. Then I was the uh, executive officer of Del Toro. Then I went overseas to. Fadi uh, area, and we trained guys on napalm there, and then I got my orders to go to the night fighter squadron. Which was where? Well, that's where I was trying to find that island that was down south of Guam about an hour and a half. Uh huh. And uh, but that's you trained in, in a new airplane then. In, in a, we never had any airplane. You never got anything. No. Never had a plane. And that's where the war ended for you. Well, the war was ended when, when they shipped me. Well, they dropped the bomb already, so it was pretty close to over. Okay, so then you go back and... Yeah, then I come back to Long Beach. And you get out and you go into real estate. Yeah. Is that where you stayed then, is in real yeah. estate? Yeah, well, yeah, kind of yeah. construction type. It was a little niche of and building buildings for people that wanted to lease, not, not being a broker. Children, grandchildren? Yeah, I have three children, and I have a boy and two girls there. And how many grandchildren? One. One grandchild. And uh, so then you migrated to Palm Springs area? Yes, I came down here, and well, I came down here in 75 as a weekender. And, and then I moved here. And uh, about 80, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you've been here for yeah. 22 years yeah. permanent? Yeah, I've been here over 25 years. Uh, oh, permanent, yeah, 20-something years. Okay, well, yeah. I 
I want to thank you for your well, time. Thank you. I certainly enjoyed it. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. But. I'm, I'm a little. I think we used to give that tape to yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure when he said put the tape in here. So let me. We. I. I got to find out which tape now. I give you. Yeah. It's